All right, so here I'm just going to show you a, a, a summary view of, um, of, of, of what the process looks like. So I mentioned before that, that it's, it's very important to write the stuff down. And so on the left-hand side, I show the, the, the canvas. And I show multiple ones of these. And the reason I have this is we have got, um, it's, it's so simple to create one of these canvases. And as we'll talk, talk later after lunch, is that it is, um, in, in the early days, I do recommend people actually create multiple versions of their canvas and really play around with it. So the whole brainstorming part of it is very valuable in helping you identify what might be more viable uh, businesses to really go after than others. And, so, and, and what this is trying to avoid is what we like to call it the local maxima problem. So in computer science, there's this term called the hill climbing algorithm. And what that really is saying is that if you're on a hill, we, we can do a lot of micro-optimizations to figure out the path to get to the top of the hill. And many times we fall into that trap, even as entrepreneurs, is we, we too often have this original idea. We have an inkling of problem, solution, customer, and we just start building that right away and optimizing that all the way through. But we fail to actually miss the mountain that's right next to it. So rather than going after a graphic designer, if I had just taken that same product and solution and maybe gone after an attorney, I would have gotten a much, a much more scalable business. That's just a, an example I can throw out there. And so, it, so what we're trying to do here is really take a broad sweep of, um, of, of potential businesses uh, or, or potential business models and try to test them in parallel, even if it's on paper, trying to brainstorm them and see which ones have the most chances of succeeding. So we're trying to prioritize where we start uh, to begin with. And right off the bat, we might eliminate some because they may, they may not be either viable or they may not be places we can reach. So from my own experience, I was building a file sharing example, uh, sorry, a file sharing product, um, which uh, started out with, with a very kind of loose customer definition. And, and even, even that one, um, it could have been applied in many different places. I, at the end, I had graphic designers using it and small businesses using it. But I, I might have wanted to apply it into, say, a, a defense um, place because it had, it, it, had it had the ability to do kind of very secure file transfers. I might have said maybe the government could be a good example for this. But because I have no reach or no channels or no path into uh, getting a defense contract or, or, or getting in front of anyone in the government to say that might be something I just rule off the bat. And maybe something I come back to, but not where I necessarily start with. And we'll talk about how you prioritize these, these canvases or these business models. But that's an exercise that we go through on paper, and not just with yourself, but with your team, team of co-founders, team of advisors, team of investors, to try to figure out what are the right places to start. And then we start the identification of risks. So that there, too, there's kind of this skill that's required to say, looking at this canvas, what is really risky about it? You know, is it really the path to customers that's risky? Is it really the problems? And there are some universal risks that I'll talk about that are good starting places. There are exceptions, of course, because every, every product can be different. Some risks are, are, uh, are more inherent in others than, than other, pro other types of products. So we'll talk about how you identify risks on those canvas. And then you go through these uh, systematic, systematic process of eliminating those risks. And so it's, it's, we, we, I mentioned the problem solution fit stage. So initially, we're trying to understand the problem. We're trying to define the solution. And that is that problem solution fit stage. And along the way, we are, we're still taking a broad sweep. So when I do the interviews, um, we talk about brainstorming potential customers. So in that file sharing example, in my mind, I do think that graphic designers might be a good, a, a, a good customer segment, but also attorneys, also, uh, say, architects, or, or maybe um, uh, medical professionals. And so I, I would draw canvases for each one of those and go and interview each one of those and see where I get the most resonance. Because I might find a lot of resistance from the medical professionals because there's a lot of HIPAA compliance and it's a lot of work to kind of even break through those barriers. But I might find it easier to start with a graphic designer or not. So those are all things that we measure kind of in parallel in the beginning. So we're doing that broad sweep as well and still helping to run some of these things in parallel. And at some point, though, you have to kind of hone in on a single canvas, a single business model, because you cannot be running like multiple experiments and with multiple customer segments for too long. So you have to kind of narrow down and then drive that all the way home through product market fit. And I'll talk about this a little bit more, but I, I also break that validation into two, into two phases. So initially, when, you, when you're out to, to validate a, a product, whether it's working, one of the first things we do is we actually, we actually look for qualitative validation. So it's not important to, even if you're trying to go after millions of customers, you don't have to start there. Even if you can get 
hundreds of customers or thousands of customers using your service and a majority of them saying they really like what you're doing, um, then it's not a stretch to where you can figure out the channels to scale the product because you have something people want. That's when you go into that scaling stage and then begin to verify that stuff quantitatively. So this is kind of this kind of summarizes the the, the, the methodology and, and what we will talk about for the rest of the day. Um, I will say that one metaphor or analogy that I like to use here is one of a key locator um, example. So I don't know if any of you have seen those RFID devices where if you lose keys, they kind of beep and help you locate in the room. So one Christmas, I had to buy it from my wife because she's always losing her keys. And that worked for a few months till we lost the key locator. <laughs> so then we, we're kind of out of luck. Yeah. I, I just have a question. Sure. So I would say that, and I talk about partnerships a little bit later. Um, so I would say it depends on the kind of partnership you're trying to, to structure. And, and, and it, I would say that there have even been kind of many posts by um, VCs who have seen this firsthand too, is that in the earlier stages, partnerships are very hard to make work because you have got a product that isn't proven yet. And if you're doing a partnership, you know, the classic example is the Microsoft partnership, which really doesn't mean anything. It's just the stamp you put on your website. But even if you've got another startup or another company that is, is partnering and they have 10 other products they're partnered with, um, unless there's, there's real incentives to, to sell your products, when it, it comes down to the salespeople. If they can go and sell, at the, at the end of the month, everyone has to meet their quota. And if they can go out and sell um, nine products that they've always sold month over month, they can double their energy down and try to sell those. Why would they want to pick a new product that is untested? So I think to me it just boils down to the kind of partnership that you have in place. And if there is a real incentive to where it actually can work, then by all means that's a, a good opportunity to pursue. Um, but I, I, tend to, I, I tend to steer people more towards um, trying to do a lot of it on your own initially. If you can establish even that initial beachhead to say I've got customer segment A and this is the value proposition they have and they they're have it, at least that's something you have, you, you control, and then looking to see if the partnerships make sense after that. That's just my, my personal uh, preference. Any other questions? So anyways, when I was going with the, the, the key locator analogy, was trying to illustrate this process with that. So as, assuming I have a key somewhere lost in this room, I'm kind of in this stage here. And what I have on my, in my hand is a locator device that's going to beep when it, when it gets a signal from that key. And so the way that I actually first start, like figure out where I need to go, is I take a very broad sweep of the room. I almost do a pivot around in the circle. And so I'm looking for a signal. Any signal is not going to be a very strong one. But even if it's a weak signal, at least I know the general direction I need to walk towards. And as I get closer to the key, as I start walking towards it, the, the, the sweeps that I'm taking are much narrower. And so you start to converge on just a few models that you're really testing. You've already uh, eliminated most of the room. And as you get closer and closer to the key, th those, those adjustments become even more micro to where you actually locate the key. And that would be what we call product market fit. So that's a kind of a good kind of real world illustration of the process of really that search of a viable business model or a plan that's, that's starting to work. Because you do have to take those broad sweeps. And there is this tuning that goes along the way to get you down to, to that that um, ideal or sustainable model.